Good morning. I know what you thought is the Ladies Objection. and gentlemen, Dr. The Honorable Nigel Clark, Minister of Finance and the Public Service. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the post-budget debate press conference. My name is Daniel Pasley, and I will be your moderator for this morning. We will have remarks by Dr. The Honorable Nigel Clark, after which we'll have a Q&A section where journalists are able to ask their questions. You may type it in the chat box, or you may identify yourself by raising your hand on the Zoom platform, and then you may ask your question. So you have two options. Ms. Shelley Ann Weeks will be asking the questions from the chat box after the minister has made his remarks. Over to you, Dr. Clark. Thank you. I just want to say good morning uh, to all uh, journalists and members of the public who have uh, joined this uh, broadcast or this uh, post-budget press conference. Uh, I don't have, you know, I said what I had to say uh, on Tuesday. And uh, as is customary, uh, as I did last year, and I believe I did it the year before, I still make, make myself available uh, to answer any questions on my presentation that members of the media or of the public may have. Uh, over to you, Daniel. All right, thank you so much, Minister Clark. We may now turn over to or we just turn over to persons in the chat. If they have any questions, please use the time now to ask your questions because I know that you may have some uh, deeper questions you want to ask based on Minister's very comprehensive presentation on Tuesday. All right. In the meantime, I will pose a question. Minister, you made a very good presentation, especially about the Serve Jamaica program. Could you explain to the public how it will happen uh, in a face-to-face -face basis? Thank you. So, I mean, the Serve Jamaica program, uh, Social and Economic Recovery with Vaccines program, has a, a number of elements and will be implemented over the course of the year. The economic recovery components, which consist of a, a major infrastructure program, you know, will uh, elements of that are already underway in terms of the uh, south, southern, the South Coast Im Highway Improvement Project, and that will be a 12-month activity throughout all of fiscal 21-22. We expect a special infrastructure project, which is the $8 billion project involving uh, major drainage works and works to uh, major thoroughfares, widening of roads, uh, etc. Uh, that will begin uh, in the next fiscal year. I can't say precisely when, uh, but I believe you'll hear from the, the Ministry of Economic Growth about that. There are some uh, preparatory steps that have to be put in place. Uh, with respect to some of the other programs, such as the, the Paint the City program, uh, $300 million, and the River Training program, again, we'll make further announcements on exactly when those will start because there are some organization that we have to, uh, we have to do uh, to prepare. You mentioned in your presentation about uh, the CARE program, about an extension for best cash and set cash. Could you explain the timelines for those? Yeah, so in my, in my closing presentation, I'll, be, I'll provide more details. But the payouts will be made in, April, in the months of April, May, and June. That we can be specific on. That's when the payouts will occur. Thank you, Minister. Do we have any questions in the chat? Not as yet. All right, but I know there uh, is another concern, or should I say another burning question about, in terms of the 
the dedication of the money funds being funded for the vac especially for the vaccines. Uh, could you highlight, I know that you mentioned it in your presentation, could you highlight the various areas that the funding for the vaccination program will go towards? So the Serve Jamaica program allocates $6 billion towards vaccines, and that is to be used for the procurement of vaccines, to actually purchase vaccines from suppliers, as well as the storage of vaccines. You know, the vaccines have to be stored under specific circumstances. Uh, as well as the distribution of vaccines. The Ministry of Health has announced many sites across Jamaica, including health centers where vaccination can take place. That comes with attendant costs, you know, preparing those sites and providing ancillary services to those sites. And of course, the administration, there's a you know, computer system that has to be uh, procured, software, uh, storage, data management, et cetera. So that is to cover all of those costs and also to uh, make room for the possibility that prices could increase over time. So we are, you know, again, you know, planning for tomorrow, as I said in my presentation, and trying to, to cover uh, the possibilities and therefore providing, you know, $6 billion, uh, which uh, should, more, should be more than sort of adequate to cover us over the course of the year in order to attain levels of vaccination um, that are consistent with herd immunity. Thank you so much, Minister. I'll now turn over to Ms. Shelley Ann Weeks. I get that we have a question. Stephen from the Gleaner has indicated that he'd like to ask a question. So, Mr. Stephen from the Gleaner, you may ask your question. Just open your mic and you may go ahead. Testing. Yes, we're hearing you. Just speak up right. a little bit more. Okay. Um, good morning, all, um, Minister. Um, morning. Good morning. Morning. Uh, Jamaica. It's just a very just for my own clarification. Jamaica should grow between four to eight percent in the in the upcoming fiscal year. How does that pace of recovery for the island compare to other Caribbean countries? And um, and and the world economy. Okay, so the, the, the projections that you mentioned are indeed the projections of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and I believe the Bank of Jamaica has similar projections. Um, you know, we, we believe that Jamaica's growth will be uh, consistent with uh, growth that we're going to be seeing around the region and around the world. I mean, different countries are, are different, and the crisis has affected countries in very, very different ways. Uh, some of our uh, sister countries in the region are much more highly dependent on tourism than we are and would have experienced much higher declines this year. So though we are forecasting a 12% decline, uh, the projections for some of our na the neighboring countries in the Caribbean space are declines of 20% this year a GDP contraction, 24%, 25%. So it's possible, depending on how quickly tourism recovers, that those economies could register larger uh, numerical gains just by virtue of that fact. So, you know, the, the crisis affects us and has affected the region in different ways. And as a result, the, uh, the recovery will be differentiated as well. Uh, if, you know, Jamaica, as I said, those projections that you mentioned are the, the projections uh, from our official uh, economic forecasting agencies in Jamaica, and uh, we'd be, you know, well on our way to recovery uh, if those materialize. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ms. Shalene, we have another question. This question is from Ms. Carleen Smith. What are our plans for the resuscitation of job growth given the significant increase in the unemployment levels as a result of the pandemic? Right, so a lot, you know, the, the nature of this is crisis um, is such that it's been channeled through the fact that we've had to live with restrictions on movement of people 
in order to slow the spread of the virus. Once people are able to move around more freely, we're going to see economic activity pick up, and that economic activity is likely to be accompanied with job growth, as we saw the job growth to the quarter end in October of, of 2019. The vaccination program is going to be essential to that because as soon as our vulnerable population is substantially vaccinated, the real risk that the measures are attempted to uh, protect us from, and that is the risk of our hospital system being overwhelmed for extended periods of time, that risk begins to subside. And the room for economic activity to expand uh, begins to increase that room. Now, what the government is doing is that we are uh, prioritizing within the envelope of expenditure that we that is possible, uh, and we're prioritizing. We've increased capital expenditure by 20% and allocated a large share of it uh, to uh, infrastructure projects through the CERV program. And we're spending $31 billion on infrastructure at all levels. Uh, and that infrastructure uh, spend will generate uh, jobs and will have an impact on other uh, sectors as well. Uh, we'll have thousands of jobs through that infrastructure spend on highways, on secondary roads, and on major thoroughfares, drains and in drain infrastructure, water infrastructure, sewage infrastructure. Uh, it would be, and we have seen that before, right, when we've had big construction growth and big infrastructure spend, uh, we've seen the attendant job growth that has come from that. But in addition, the programs, uh, you know, the Pay in the City programs and the uh, programs for uh, the river training programs and the other programs announced will also provide uh, temporary jobs for uh, others as well. So, so, you know, we expect that as the economy reopens, as we are vaccinated, economic activity will pick up, and that is likely to be accompanied by job growth. But we're not waiting on that. We are catalyzing and stimulating uh, further job growth through our infrastructure spend and through the social programs that we are going to be implementing this year. Has there been any interest from private entities, pharmacies, private doctors to purchase COVID-19 vaccination independently? And how would that, if at all, soften the financial burden on the state for vaccine purchases? Okay, that's more a question for the Minister of Health, I would respectfully submit. Um, what I can say is that we have provided, you know, the Minister of Health has, you know, put forward a, <clears throat> and has put it in the public domain how much the vaccines are costing for the vaccines alone, and we have provided uh, double that amount uh, to allow for the possibility of the government to purchase more if they become available or to take account for the fact that prices could increase or that we have storage and distribution costs. So the, the government is well equipped and well prepared to purchase you know, all the vaccines that become available that are necessary for our population. Uh, to the extent that others you know, uh, want to do so, I mean, you have to talk to, that's a question for the Minister of Health, that's a health policy question. From the Ministry of Finance, however, we have made uh, substantial provisions, as uh, was announced on Tuesday, and as I repeated just moments ago, for the purchase, storage, distribution, and administration of vaccines. Okay, this question is from a social media user. Does the change from two to one guarantors for SLB pose a risk of persons being hesitant to be sole guarantor or compounding the problem? So the, by going from to the requirement from two to one guarantors, that's, that doesn't mean that you can only have one guarantor. If it is uh, useful for you as an applicant to have more than one because someone doesn't want to be a sole guarantor, then that's a decision that you can make. What we're saying is that if you can only manage to find a single guarantor, the state will not withhold the opportunity from you to borrow from the Student Loan Bureau. And this is in response to uh, feedback that we've received over a number of years that uh, persons, particularly persons from lower income brackets, 
uh, find it difficult to find more than one guarantor. Right? And again, as I said in my presentation, we are uh, seeking to balance accessibility with uh, sustainability. The Student Loans Bureau uh, doesn't work if it can't be sustained. It doesn't work if the monies lent are not paid back. But similarly, our policy objectives are not achieved if the loans are not accessible to people. So here we're making an attempt to make it accessible by putting a less burdensome standard for uh, guarantors uh, and at the same time not removing it entirely because to do so would compromise uh, sustainability. Facebook asking about the status of set cash, whether or not it will be extended. Could you expand on that a little more? Yes, I had announced in my, one of the things I was very pleased to announce uh, in my budget presentation is that uh, we are going to have set cash payments in April. I have to wait until the new budget, until the new year begins, which is the 1st of April. And uh, set cash payments for the month uh, to be paid in the months of April, May, and June uh, for persons who lost their jobs due to COVID and remain unemployed. And the full eligibility and, uh, will be spelt out uh, later, um, meaning, yeah, will be spelt out later, but the payments uh, will be made in the months of April, May, and June. And, you know, that, we estimate that uh, there'll be 50,000 Jamaicans who will benefit from those payments. And by June, we expect uh, certainly, or June slash July, the schedule that's been published by the Ministry of Health, we expect the vulnerable population in Jamaica, I mean those over 60, uh, to be substantially vaccinated by then, which will, be, which will make a world of a difference uh, in terms of the measures that will become necessary at that point uh, to stop the spread, right? Because remember, it's the vulnerable population that disproportionately uh, leads to hospitalizations and to ICU capacity uh, being absorbed. And uh, so once that segment of the population is vaccinated, it offers uh, hope that uh, economic activity that has been restrained by measures uh, will uh, begin, will not only, uh, the, the growth in that activity will resume. Okay, thank you, Minister. We have another. We have another question from Stephen at the Gleaner. Mm -hmm. The BOJ paid the government of Jamaica a dividend to assist the Serve Jamaica program. At the same time, the BOJ instructed banks not to pay shareholders dividends <laughs> in the year. Is this a double standard that essentially hurts small shareholders? You know, I could depend on you, Stephen, to ask a question like that. Uh, the, first of all, the BOJ has not paid a dividend yet. The, uh, the dividend will be paid in the first week of April, and the dividend relates to profits that the central bank has made. And by law, it's not a discretionary activity. Uh, the, the BOJ Act uh, speaks to the central bank paying over to the consolidated fund uh, profits that it makes in a particular year. So this is a legislated uh, requirement. So it's not directly uh, comparable. And bear in mind that this dividend, the, the largest dividend, uh, largest single dividend that's ever been paid uh, to the government of Jamaica from an entity, uh, a public entity, um, comes at a time that uh, where we need it. Uh, it's $33 billion, and uh, you just have to think what activities would not be possible without that uh, dividend. So I, I hope you're not complaining there, Stephen, with your question, but, but the situations are not analogous. This is a, a legal requirement. It is the law that the central bank pays over uh, dividends on profits that it makes. All right, we have some um, question from social media. Uh, no new taxes has become a welcome the hallmark of this government budget presentations. However, what can be done to manage the increase in prices, such as gas and utilities, which affects most Jamaicans? Right, so you know, we have um, made a lot of investment, policy investment, in strengthening the central bank and in changing the mandate of the central bank. Before 
before, and we're going to make that all effective on the 16th of April. Before the 16th of April 2021, the mandate of the Bank of Jamaica has been, you know, this and that and that and this, a whole hodgepodge of different things that makes it difficult to hold a central bank to account. Effective April 16th, the unequivocal, uh, unambiguous mandate of the central bank is going to be uh, price stability, which means uh, keeping inflation uh, low and predictable and stable. And we have empowered the central bank uh, with the resources to be able to do so and with the governance structure, the accountability structures, and the transparency apparatus. And uh, what we are likely to see as a result of that is that in inflation rate in Jamaica is likely to continue to be low and stable. The target rate of inflation is between 4 and 6%. Uh, so, you know, we expect in general uh, for price movements in that, uh, at, in, within that band over the medium term. Um, and if you compare that with our history, you just have to look at how inflation has evolved over the past 30 years. Uh, you will quickly recognize that what we've experienced over the past five or six years of inflation between 3% and maybe 5.5% uh, is at the extreme low end of our historical experience. And we expect that to continue um, with the empowering or empowerment of the Bank of Jamaica, and that in itself, the independence of the Bank of Jamaica to pursue these, ob these objectives is, will further reinforce inflation expectations uh, converging with inflation target and becoming uh, self-reinforcing uh, in the way that it is in other societies. All right, so I have been informed that the, we have one more question. We have one more question. This question is from IG. They're coming in. This one is from IG. Will, th will there be a stimulus, stimulus for rural areas, especially because of loss of jobs and job security? Right. So let me just say, you know, a large number of the persons who are on our set cash program are from rural Jamaica. In fact, I would even dare to say a majority of persons who receive set cash grants uh, and who are beneficiaries of best cash grants, the, um, a ma big majority of the 50,000 are in rural Jamaica. Our infrastructure spending program of $31 billion is largely in rural Jamaica. Uh, $17.7 billion from uh, Harborview to Port Antonio uh, and also extending the highway into Williams Field. Uh, the special infrastructure project will include uh, rural areas our river training uh, program uh, is all going to be spent in rural areas to uh, train rivers and reduce the risk of uh, flooding and natural disaster in areas that have been historically prone to that. Our Paint the City uh, $300 million program uh, will have elements in Kingston, but there will be several uh, rural towns that will also be included, and the Minister of Local Government and rural development, we'll speak to that uh, later. So uh, absolutely, we, um, in the programs that we have, uh, and, and by the way, you know, normally river training programs are like 30 million a year. We have increased that seven times. Just to show you, to 200 million, uh, just to show you the emphasis that we are placing to ensure that uh, uh, rural Jamaica is included in our social and economic recovery programs. And as I sort of outlined, and I am repeating, the vast majority, certainly of the, of the set cash and best cash benefits, which are programmed at about $3 billion uh, over the months of April, May, and June, uh, will accrue to persons who are in rural Jamaica. Okay, this one is from social media. At a time when we have the worst economic recession in history, the government has announced no new taxes. Will there be a rollback on this, as, as has happened before? Should harder time face us, face us? Well, I don't think we've ever had a four-year period of no new taxes. Um, and in that four-year period, uh, there has been no rollback uh, once those announcements have been made. 
So, uh, you know, we, we're transparent with our policy. I have uh, leveled with the Jamaican people and, and uh, explained the circumstances that we're in, how difficult those circumstances are. But I've also spoken to uncertainties and, and risks and the fact that, uh, you know, so we, um, we face this crisis, which is, has, as I mentioned in my presentation yesterday, has been like a, a punch to the gut, but we responded and we remain uh, standing. And my uh, announcement of no new taxes in that context uh, has, as you have pointed out, sort of resonated with the Jamaican people, but it is born of a belief and conviction that because we are targeting a quick recovery, and a, re a quick recovery is absolutely essential, we ha you know, absolutely essential, uh, and an increase in taxes at this time would inhibit such a recovery and be inimical to such a recovery. And that is the underlying thesis and thinking behind the policy of uh, no new taxes this year. Okay, we have a question from the Twitter. This one seems to be quite a hot topic. Will the government revisit the $50 customs limit anytime in the future? Yeah, so, you know, I, I was duty-bound to respond to the question. I know many people on Twitter have been talking about it for, for months. And as I had promised I would, I would, I promised I would look into it. And I did look into it. I got all the data. I got all the numbers. And I provided an explanation uh, to the Jamaican people why we couldn't at this stage uh, move that threshold. But in the future, certainly, it is something that we can look at. Uh, when conditions change, uh, when the environment improves, uh, as our foreign exchange earnings begin to uh, be restored, right? remember that we have lost 2.5 billion US dollars of foreign exchange earnings this year. Uh, and our foreign exchange earnings from tourism are at a 30-year low, right? So as soon as those conditions change, uh, we can absolutely uh, reassess that threshold. All right, well, this is a question that I am personally asking. When the announcement was made yesterday about the $10,000 grant for senior citizens who get uh, vaccinated, there were a lot of um, comments about it. it. sounded like a bribe, some people say. Could you expand a little bit more on that or explain the thinking behind that? Sure. So, you know, public policy is, can be a very important instrument in achieving results that are in the public's interest. Now, it is established around the world that it is in the public's interest that our population is vaccinated, and more importantly, that our vulnerable population is vaccinated. Because, as I explained before, when our vulnerable population is vaccinated, we can be, we can uh, have more certainty that restrictive measures are unlikely to be required. Because it's the vulnerable population uh, who, if affected with the coronavirus, or with COVID-19, end up in hospital, in ICU, in numbers that can overwhelm the health capacity. So it's established that there is a public interest. The country has an interest in the vulnerable population being vaccinated. Now, we are aligning that objective in a public policy initiative that says, look, if you are over 60 and you uh, are in an income group where you earn less than one and a half million, you know, formally, uh, and you have been vaccinated, then you're eligible to receive uh, this grant. And it is a conditional cash grant. It's not unique or new. Our PATH program is a conditional cash grant grant program, right? It's conditioned on children being in school. It's conditioned on other requirements. If those conditions are not met, you are not eligible for the PATH grant. 
And conditional cash transfers, as I mentioned in my opening response to your question, are recognized policy tools designed to achieve outcomes that are consistent with the public's interest. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, we are providing something that is conditioned on action being taken by the citizen that's consistent with the public's interest. All right, we have two more questions. I think this will be our final two questions. Thank you for participating so gently, Minister, so far. All right, so the first question is, will there be any government-led divestments or IPOs within this fiscal year? Very good question, very good question. We, uh, we had announced earlier that we, have been wor we are working on uh, at least two at the moment, uh, the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, and the Jamaica Public Service Company. The government owns 100% of the mortgage bank and it owns approximately 20% of JPS. And those uh, divestments have been uh, in train for some time and I expect that um, we'll have at least, at least one of them during the fiscal year, maybe two. Uh, uh, let's see, we'll provide a, a more detailed update at a later time. All right, looking forward to that. And the other question is, can you provide more details on the proposed new SME funds at DBJ and the total amount of equity that you think can be catalyzed by this initiative as well as the modality of the proposed loans? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. That's something that I'm very excited about. Uh, we are providing a loan of $5 billion to the Develop Development Bank of Jamaica. Two billion of that five is to be used to seed two equity funds with a billion dollars each on condition that the fund manager raises additional equity from private and institutional investors. So the government would be investing alongside other investors. And that's important because um, that provides a greater, uh, the greater chance that the government's money will, will be used uh, properly. So that two billion we expect to be, to catalyze a further at least six billion dollars in uh, companion investment from institutional institutions. Because we'd be saying to the, the fund managers, look, we will start you off with the billion, but you have to go out and raise an additional three as a minimum. Um, and so, from that initiative, we are hoping to have $8 billion of equity funds. And remember, equity is permanent capital that you don't, that the MSME does not pay back. You are able to, uh, you, uh, are, the, the, the investor is able to recoup his or it, its investment uh, by selling those shares in the same way that we're going to be selling the shares for the Jamaica Mortgage Bank and selling the shares, uh, the 20% of shares that we own in JPS. Um, so that's where that $2 billion is going to go. $8 billion of equity capital for the MSME sector. Today, as it stands, um, equity permanent capital available for MSMEs um, doesn't really exists in any substantial degree. So to the extent that we're able to execute on it, it will be a massive change in the MSME space. We're also providing a loan of a billion dollars to DBJ for the DBJ to uh, on lend to MSMEs who are interested in making the digital transition in their business. As you know, uh, having e-commerce capability and having the, the modality where you as a business can interact with your customers through the internet, where they can browse your products, they can uh, interact online with your products, they can choose, they can purchase, and by purchasing, they can uh, end up receiving that product or that service. Sometimes digitally if the product is an intangible like a license or a book or a brochure or um, a set of instructions or a ticket um, or receive it physically through a delivery mechanism if it's a physical product. This billion dollars will supplement an 
existing program at the DBJ where MSMEs can qualify for a $200,000 grant in order to purchase this e-commerce platform from any one of the 25 Jamaican IT service providers who have been approved uh, under this government program to supply the MSME, MSME market. What the additional billion dollars will do, it will allow this DBJ program to scale up from $200,000, a $200,000 grant to a $200,000 grant and up to an $800,000 2% loan. And so we're, 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 what we're saying is uh, there are $200,000 before, we're multiplying that by five and saying, look, we're putting a million dollars up for any MSME that meets the qualifying criteria that wants to transition to the digital space to do so. Because again, there's a public interest in bringing greater levels of efficiency and productivity to our MSME space, because that in itself will lead to greater economic activity and an and expansion of economic activity, growth, jobs, and so on. So that's again uh, the third element, or the second element of that five billion that I'm very excited about. The third element is a billion dollars for loans to MSMEs. And again, the DBJ, uh, not, sorry, I said one, it's two billion of loans uh, through the DBJ, and they will announce the details on how those loans can be accessed. Thank you so much, Minister. And in the interest of time, we'll be wrapping up this press conference. I want to say thank you to persons on social media for your thought-provoking questions and also the members of the media. Also, special thanks to the Financial, financial Secretary, Ms. Darlene Morrison, for attending, and also Mr. Trevor Anderson, Principal Director uh, from the Fiscal Policy Management Branch here at the Ministry. I also must thank our hardworking JS production team and other persons behind the scenes. On behalf of the Ministry of Finance, I thank all persons for tuning in and do enjoy the rest of your day.